Reverend Otto Witt was sent to South Africa to bring Christianity on behalf of the Swedish missionary. By January of 1879, he had a small congregation of converted Zulus and others at the mission station near Rorkstrift. But this peaceful life soon changed when on the 9th, the center column of Lord Chelmsford's invading force made camp here. Wood's house was soon converted into a hospital to care for the ill of the campaign, the chapel housing extra supplies for the army. When Chelmsford crossed into Zululand on the 11th, he led behind a small contingent to defend the supplies commanded by Henry Spaulding. The makeshift garrison's backbone was made up of B Company of the 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot, commanded by Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead. Bromhead was well liked among his troops, but was growing deaf. This was probably the reason why his company was detached to Rourke Strift. They were aided by a few hundred Natal native contingent, also held in reserve. In the following days, some 30 patients would be taken under the care of Surgeon James Reynolds. Among those was Corporal Christian Schiess, suffering from swollen feet due to ill-fitting shoes upon the rugged roads. The commissary overseeing the supplies consisted of a small team locally sourced, including Louis Brine, who was acting storekeeper. A small work party arrived at the station by the 19th, led by Lieutenant John Chard. They were sent to Rourke Strift to fix a broken pond, distributing supplies across the Buffalo River. All was peacefully ordinary at the mission, even with his military presence. By the 22nd, expected reinforcements had yet to arrive to Rourke Strift. Unannounced to Spalding, they had become bogged down by rains hampering the road to help him make her. The Major left to see what the delay was about, leaving Char to take over the station. The day grew more unsettling by the sounds of battle ten miles to the northeast. Reynolds, Witt, and a few others took to the large Yanni Hill south of the mission to try to see what was occurring. A haze could be seen hanging where the peak of East Sanawana jutted above the skyline. By three o'clock, riders of the NNC began to arrive on the banks of the Buffalo, pleading to be ferried across. They brought news of the disastrous defeat that befell the camp at East Sanawana. A council was called by Chart and Bromhead to decipher the horde news rushing to camp. Soon, the plight of where to vacate the camp came into bait. But knowing it would take far too long to remove those in the hospital, and the threat of being out in the open and defended, the officers chose to instead fortify Rourke's Drift. Unfortunately for the small garrison, 4,000 Zulus were only a few miles south of the station. These were commanded by Prince Dablamanzi Kampande. These were the Undicor held in reserve at East Senawanda. King Ketswayo had ordered his impis to not cross the buffalo, to not appear as instigators, but Dabla Manzi disobeyed these orders, hoping instead to wreak havoc upon the British communication lines. He hoped his ties with Ketswayo would spare him of harsh punishment. The small impi pursued fugitives for ten miles through the mountains in the tall. By 4 p.m., they came into contact with the NNC horses. Quickly, these horse riders realized the numbers game was heavily against them and fled. The sound of swiftly moving Zulus began to rattle the men at Rourke's Drift. As the pickets retreated past the mission, one of the riders called out, Here they come! Thick as fleas! Black as hell! Causing most of the tall natives and their white NCOs to flee from the mission. Furious at seeing their NCOs flee, a few shot, killing one of the NCOs. Chard felt that he could sound defend the post with the 400-man garrison he initially had, but now only 150 remained. Chard quickly ordered construction of an interior wall made of biscuit box boxes to fall upon. Within the final minutes of preparation, Reverend Witt decided he had no place at this mission and fled for safety. The first Zulu wave appeared at 4.30. At about 500 yards, the order for the British to fire was given. The Zulus continued for the hail of gunfire, only being halted about 50 yards from the southern wall, some using the cookhouse for protection, trying to make final dashes to the barricade. The bulk of the regiment, however, realized the hopelessness of a rear assault and began veering around the hospital to target the northern face of the defenses. Tall grass below the rocky ridge masked the Zulus until they were upon the barricade. Here, Asagia's spears met bayonet outside the hospital. Several soldiers later remarked that their bayonets were the only thing that made the Zulus flinch. A bayonet charge eventually dissolved the wave. As soon as the initial wave broke apart, Dabla Manzi led the three main regiments around the western side of the defenses. Rumored to be on horseback, the prince oversaw as his Zulus took cover within the brush north of the station, making a similar advance toward the hospital. 
The detachment of Zulus fanned out upon Shiani Hill, equipped with muskets. Sporadic fire began to rain down upon the station's defenders. However, the old age of the firearms and lack of training made them largely ineffective. Didn't I mean they were completely useless. Louis Biner of Ireland was walking back and forth among the wounded, giving them water. In the process, he was shot through the skull and killed instantly. The injured Chies witnessed the death, hobbling out of the hospital and joined the fight. He soon took position behind the storehouse barricade and managed to kill three of the Zulu snipers. Soon the fighting shifted to the roadway leading into the station. Sometime around 5.30, the Zulus managed to breach the barricade. Hand-to-hand -hand combat erupted. Shard and Brom had gathered a half dozen men to plug the line, but by doing so, left other portions of the wall unprotected. By 6, Char decided it was time to fall back upon the inner biscuit box defense. The soldiers surrounded near the hospital didn't need to be told twice. A quick retreat across the yard was made. As the yard vacated, the hospital soon became swamped by waves of Zulus. Throughout the fight, the wounded and sick had held off wave after wave through the windows and loopholes cut through the walls. But now, smoke began to fill the narrow rooms within the building. The thatch roof had been set ablaze to snuff out the occupants. Zulus managed to bust through one of the doors and started fighting their way into the hospital. Unfortunately for occupants such as Henry Hook, the rooms were only accessible from the outside, designed the feature to house guests and allow them to have privacy. Fortunately, as Hook put it later, these shoddy inside bricks proved their salvation. The surviving occupants were quickly able to break holes within the walls using the butts of their rifles and crawl from room to room to safety. Hook and John Williams aided in holding off the Zulu in advance for an hour before they themselves vacated the burning building. All but four of the defenders escaped the burning hospital. Most of the patients were brought to safety to the biscuit box defense. As night fell upon Rourke's Drift, the inferno illuminated much of the battlefield. The waves of Zulus crashing through the yard to the west were made easily visible. Double Amanzi was quick to realize this and began directing the attack to shift directly from the north and east through a large crawl below the station. In the dark, the Zulus were mostly obscured from view till being on top of the barricade. Within this new position, Charter directed a construction of a redoubt to shoot from an elevated position. Zulus attempted to burn the storehouses, but were unable to get in good position due to those firing out of the loopholes from inside. The night was an unusual arena for war for the Zulus, who believed bad omens lay within the dark. But Dabla Manzi kept up the pressure, believing victory was very near. The Zulus eventually breached the defenses of the crawl, pushing the defenders to the back wall. By 9 p.m., the elevated fire from the redoubt stalled any further advance into the now tiny perimeter. Sporadic attacks continued till midnight. The garrison, however, held. The light of the morning revealed the full devastation of the attack. The charred remains of the hospital reeked of burned flesh. The bodies of some 350 Zulus remained scattered upon the ground, and that's not accounting for the hundreds more that were probably pulled from the field. Chard would later report that he began the battle of 20,000 rounds. Now, he only had 900. The garrison was rattled when the Zulu MP appeared above the hills overlooking the station, but no attack was made. By 8 a.m., Chelmsford's surviving column arrived at Rourke's Drift. Among the realization that very few had escaped from Isanawana, some of the Ch uh, Chelmsford men began to stab the wounded Zulus upon the battlefield. One particular account involved Private Hook, who had the muzzle of his rifle grabbed by a wounded Zulu seeking help. Instead, he threw him off and shot him through the chest. The sad truth is that even if the British had wanted to aid the wounded Zulus, Reynolds Field Hospital was swamped with tending to the garrison's wounded. Most of the supplies were either spent or had been lost at East Santa Juana. The rains later that day made the relief further difficult. Most of the men found themselves sleeping in the mud. Bromhead's Company B were granted access to the attic of the storehouse for their defense of Rourke's Drift. Double Amandi's exhausted force retreated back into Zululand. His impi came within a few hundred yards of Chelmsford's column. The two sides looked in each other's exhausted eyes, and both did not commit to further fighting. The gamble to strike Rourke's drift had failed, and soured the victory at Isanawana. Kinkatswayo wanted a war of defense, now appeared to be the aggressor. Isanawana stunned the British to reality, to never underestimate the enemy. Rourke's drift became a symbol for the might of the British Empire, and reinvigorated their investments in the Manglo-Zulu War.